This week on the Computer Chronicles, our annual Etra special. We take you to Berlin for the annual European Technology Roundtable Exhibition. We speak to Apple's new COO, Marco Landi, about the future of the Mac. Acer's Stan Shi says the Japanese PC makers will fail where Taiwan succeeded. We look at the browser wars between Netscape and Microsoft and predict the winner. We'll see the cutting edge of new three-dimensional web interfaces and the latest in European computer design. A look into the future, the next six months, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. Additional funding from PC Connection and Mac Connection, the catalog and online superstore with over 10,000 PC and Mac products. Award-winning service, toll-free technical support, and overnight delivery. www.pcconnection.com This year's Etra conference is being held in the former East Berlin, a city which is virtually being rebuilt from the ground up. In fact, there are more than 600 major construction sites in East Berlin. And the rebirth of this 500-year-old city is providing an appropriate backdrop to a computer conference, which is focusing a lot on Apple Computer and its ability to rise again. One of the keynote speakers at Etra was Marco Landi, the new chief operating officer at Apple. Landi came to Apple from Texas Instruments, a very different kind of company. I asked Landy if he was shocked at the different business culture he found at Apple. I cannot say shocked, but certainly I was mainly surprised because uh, uh, all the decision had to go up, up to the top management. And you know, once you have a $12 billion company, there are a lot of decisions that you need to take. And there is no man strong enough, capable enough, that he can know everything and just take the decisions. I think that now, with this business unit uh, concept that we have introduced, uh, where you have a clear responsibility, we are, you can measure those, those people, the situation will be much better. It would allow, I think, uh, to have uh, the innovation to flourish again. Because, you know, sometimes uh, even the lack of discipline kills the innovation. The challenge for Landy at Apple is to add discipline without harming innovation. You need solid business processes. You need uh, to make sure that you know where to focus and you know who is responsible of uh, that specific part of the business. So you need uh, to make sure that you have uh, accountability, measurability, responsibility. But in the meantime, I want uh, to maintain that uh, level of, of innovation, creativity, desire to excel that uh, has been in the chromosome of Apple for a long time. But despite Marco Landi's enthusiasm, there was a generally negative view here about Apple's future. I don't have a good feel for it. I mean, I've, I've been a longtime fan of the Mac. Obviously, my background was at Xerox, and many of the ideas which we developed at Xerox were actually taken over in the Mac, and so I, I grudgingly became a Mac user. Um, a company that has tremendous loyalty within their customer base, as many other companies have demonstrated, including digital, loyal customer base can carry you a long ways, and so I think we should not discount that. On the other hand, the economic situation, as you look at the declining prices for commodity parts that are used in PCs at the growing strength uh, within the developer base, it's a, it's a tough challenge that Apple has. One of the things that continues to impress me is how many people here are still Mac users themselves and therefore have a tremendous hope for that company. And yet, even many of those people are really depressed about the company's prospects. And, and when I look at Apple, I see here's a company that has two fundamental problems right now that really make it hard to be optimistic. And one of those is that they have bad short-term results. They're losing money right now. And the other is they don't have any really clear, apparent long-term strategy. And that's a pretty bad combination. Today, my perception is that the market for Apple is bleak. It's bleak because they don't have the momentum, and the momentum is elsewhere. It seems that the jury has been out for a while about Apple's in incapacity to recreate itself. However, we must remember that Apple has gone through a lot of those problems before and has been able to keep its following. The problem is that the following is shrinking day by day, and even the, the, the strongest followers are starting to question whether they should remain with Apple.
This is the Reichstag, once one of the most famous symbols of power in the world. It's now being rebuilt, of course, but the Germans here ran the Third Reich, which at the time was considered an invincible world power. Of course, in those days, world power was defined more in terms of armies and control of land. Today, power is defined more in global economic terms. Today's seemingly invincible global economic power, certainly in the computer industry, is Microsoft. I have always been a believer that Microsoft fundamentally has a positive role in the industry because no matter what you might say about their predatory business practices and their potentially illegal behavior, they have created this industry in some respects by their pure promotional energy and by Bill Gates' personal promotional energy. I think that's a huge contribution. One of the hot topics at Etcher was the Microsoft Netscape competition and Microsoft's sudden turnaround on the whole internet issue. In general, Microsoft got high grades for responding to the internet wake-up call. I think they were slow to recognize the impact of the internet, and as, as, as happened before, they were quick to respond. Once, once they decided to respond, they moved very quickly. Uh, much like the old IBM, you know, they came to market late. They came to market initially with a product which was not as good, but they've been building up their market share, building up their presence. They've been able to deploy resources on the problem, as only Microsoft can, and they're obviously a very serious player. Microsoft has had an amazing turnaround, and it's, it's probably unprecedented in the history of companies of that scale and, and of that degree of influence in an industry, that they've changed their entire corporate focus as much as they have, away from focusing entirely on Windows and moving toward focusing on the Internet. I don't think they've completed the transition. I think they still have big challenges ahead of them. Though Bill Gates is the man many techies love to hate, he generally gets personal credit for the quick Microsoft turnaround on their internet strategy. If it had been a company which was not as strong as and as strongly controlled by Gates and by his charisma, it would have been totally impossible. It would have been impossible in almost any other company, even including a company which is controlled by someone like Larry Ellison. He's the only guy in the industry which was able to say, to give, to give an order to his people, and those people have been marching since then towards the internet. The other hot net topic here was the battle of the browsers between Microsoft and Netscape. And while startup Netscape now has the lead, Alex View believes that Microsoft will eventually prevail. People were saying NT will never succeed a year ago, and now today it's not even an issue. Tomorrow it will be a, a Microsoft control world from NT at the top, Windows 95 in the bottom, and the mobile business where, we, where Microsoft will be there and the intranet with Explorer because I do believe that in the Netscape Microsoft battle Netscape will not survive. Uh, Netscape will be to the internet business what Apple was for the PC business. There will be a minority player in the in the big boys game. People will love Netscape but people will use Microsoft. This is now perhaps one of the most famous symbols of freedom in the world. It's the Brandenburg Gate, which used to divide East Berlin from West Berlin. In fact, had you come here about 10 years ago, you would have seen the famous Berlin Wall there dividing this one split up city. That wall has come down, of course. In fact, many walls have come down over the past couple of years, virtual walls, which had confined and restrained the free flow of information. These walls have come down largely in the wake of the internet. Two years into the Internet revolution, the talk now is about the problems on the net and the need for better interfaces, more bandwidth, and better servers. One of the new players in the server arena is Tandem. For years, they have provided the infrastructure for mission-critical online transaction processing at banks, airlines, and hotels. They are now ready to step forward and bring some new power to the web. Well, we will start to produce what we call, uh, let's call them Internet servers. And those internet servers will have all the characteristics of the things that we do for telephone companies or credit card companies, banking institutions. And so these internet servers will be, let's call them pre-qualified to be up seven days, 24 hours, and be able to really run thousands and thousands of users at the same time. Because most internet websites today can take 10 users, 20 users, but they cannot take thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. So we're, this is the, what we call Internet OLTP, you know, the next wave of real serious transaction processing. But there is still the problem of network bandwidth. 
traffic jams and the fear of a major internet crash. Fact, Eric Benamou, CEO of 3Com, says the answer lies not just in more bandwidth, but in better management of existing uh, bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth helps uh, hide a lot of sins. But at some point, you cannot just throw bandwidth at all the problems. It becomes just too expensive. You also have to be more intelligent about how you use networks. A good analogy is, in fact, if you think about your telephone, uh, your telephone service, most people who subscribe to a telephone service have to select a plan that uh, the telephone service provider offers. Your choice of a, of a plan is actually used by the telephone company to essentially figure out what your usage patterns are and to, to manage their own telephone network more intelligently, to inject the bandwidth where they need to and, to, and and to move bandwidth around the network at different times of the day. That concept is is commonplace in telephone networks. It has not been used in data networks. The real issue on the internet is still, how do you make money? I think people who have been out trying business models on the net are beginning to think that there may not be a single solution, which is, is not surprising, but that in fact it may require a number of revenue streams to keep a website going, uh, because any one of them is, is quite thin. If you look, for example, at advertising, um, the total amount of money spent on advertising on the web last year, 1995, was equal to the amount of money spent in the United States on signs on top of taxi cabs. And it's actually not going to increase a whole lot. Perhaps by the turn of the century it could be as large or larger than the amount spent on radio. But even that does not support an industry anywhere near as big as the one we're starting to scale up. So advertising is not a solution, transactions are not by themselves a solution. It may turn out it's a mix. I've always been a little cautious about building a business where your sole source of revenue is going to be advertising. I think that will be extremely difficult long term, but there are more and more companies that are really selling genuine products through the net who have overcome some of the reservations about transmitting your credit card, and I think people are getting much more comfortable with that. I point out to everybody you're at much more risk when you use your credit card at a restaurant than when you give your credit card out over the telephone. This is the heart of the former West Berlin, the Kurfürstendamm. It's rich with shops and restaurants and boutiques. Now, of course, there were stores in East Berlin, but they weren't as nice looking and they weren't as inviting. That difference provides an appropriate metaphor again for this Etra conference, where the talk on the internet was mainly about electronic commerce and the need to create a more engaging user interface. Uh, first of all, we are not the generation who's going to make those decisions. It's my kids who are going to make those decisions. And my kids are not using, you know, the, the windows and the Netscapes. They're using the games. And the games is the way they express what they want. And I think it's the 3D graphics tool that is very powerful to express what you want out of the system. And if you can take the Doom kind of metaphor, it is really exploring information and exploring opportunities through visual contact rather than 2D pull-down contact. Indeed, much of the new technology on display here at Etra involved authoring tools that let you create visually engaging 3D environments. This is Zappa from Zappa Digital Arts, an Israeli company. Zappa is a very clever and entertaining 3D interface that can be used for virtual shopping sites or for other entertainment sites. One of the major problems on the net today that is flooded by text. Too much text out there where visual information could be much easier to adjust and understand. Now, information, if you look, if you do visual information, um, in a sense, um, we don't just look at entertainment uses, uh, or we look at educational, and takes, and, and especially at advertisement, uh, news could be also, um, but more to enable people, instead of writing a lot of text, to do visual information with our technologies. The Zappa interface uses smart 3D objects, which can react to real-time events and to each other. Zappa tools are compliant with the VRML 2.0 standard, but they also include other proprietary technologies, such as the Zapparound 3D client viewer that enhances the power of a Zappa environment. Avatars created in Zappa have real physical characteristics, such as weight, texture, and to some degree personality, since they can uniquely interact with other avatars. Really smart objects are um, autonomous 
uh, objects that they have their own pre-programmable behaviors. They are based on skeletons of one-legged objects, two-legged objects, three, four, five, etc. Where you can synthesize by using our 3D synthesizer any kind of visual shape you would like. It could be a, an avatar, a human being, a creature, or a furniture. A small Russian software company called Paragraph International is also working on 3D authoring tools for the web. Paragraph's package is called Internet 3D Space Builder. It lets you create virtual reality environments using VRML, the virtual reality markup language. Paragraph features a very simple user interface that allows relative novices to add 3D environments to their web pages. The Internet 3D Space Builder comes complete with a library of 3D objects and interactive texture mapping capabilities. And you can import standard file format sounds, videos, or other 3D files. If HTML and VRML were not enough, a British company has come up with a new web authoring language called TVML, short for Televisual Markup Language. The main emphasis in TVML is speed, allowing real-time interaction in a 3D environment. The focus of TVML is entertainment on the web. The company says TVML is basically a Java-type language, only faster. TVML was designed specifically to enable television-style motion and sound over phone lines and 28.8 modems. Our goal is to create the entertainment superhighway. And Netscape and Explorer have created the information superhighway. And we are not really competing with these guys when it comes to information. You know, we want to create consumer-style entertainment. Having said that, there is you know, entertaining information. And this way, the area comes sort of a gray area, as whether to use a Netscape browser or to use our browser. But if it's entertainment, we believe that publishers will turn to our system as opposed to HTML. And of course, our system is a plug-in to both of these browsers, so you can mix and match. So a publisher can have a regular HTML site, and then he can add a bit of interactivity, a bit of entertainment, using the TVML system. While the Internet dominates every computer conference these days, the effects of the Internet are not always positive. The Internet has really had a tremendous effect on CD-ROM financing because suddenly publishers are much more interested in exploring the Internet, which quite frankly hasn't lost money for them yet, uh, than CD-ROM, which already has. Another attraction, I think, early on was that it looked like it was much less expensive to build a website than it was to produce a CD-ROM. What a lot of publishers didn't realize, though, was that once you create a website, you have to maintain it. And so it's actually more expensive, I think, than anyone expected. The other problem on the net is figuring out how to develop websites that work for the consumer. I think that uh, web design today is, is terribly overdone, given the, um, the bandwidth that's available. And when you talk to real consumers, they simply want the information. And they will turn off the graphics very quickly, as soon as they figure out how to turn off the graphics. Uh, I have to say that I think one difficulty is a lot of art designers uh, and the people who create websites have wonderful, powerful, high bandwidth connections at their work site. Uh, I've discovered one of the best things to do is send designers home and make them look at their websites from home, and suddenly they see them in a whole different way. In some quarters, there is even doubt about whether web publishing is all it's cracked up to be. I think at, at Newsweek we've discovered that uh, the magazine works very well on paper. It's really difficult to compete with paper. Uh, there are things you can do on the web in terms of immediacy that are very exciting. Ironically, I think we find probably some of the biggest excitement about the web occurs, for example, in developing nations where they can't get Newsweek on paper or any place else. And when things like Newsweek become available, then it's very exciting. In the United States, one hears, rightly so, why would I want to read that on a screen when I can get it on paper? Some of the doubt about the Internet is being cast in the direction of the network concept itself and whether we are going too far in depending on a centralized computing infrastructure. I think it's the, the pendulum swinging back. I think people believe it will swing back too far and will get too centralized again, and all of a sudden you will find that when you depend on the servers, the system runs slower in the afternoon. And one of the reasons we all move to client-server computing with your application on your own machine is you don't have to wait until 2 in the morning to get the better performance. So I think we'll find that while there are some attractive elements of centralization, we'll find that in terms of individual performance, people will want to go back to running on their own machine. But it's hard to stop a steamroller. And in the technology exhibit room at Etra, Internet products were drawing big crowds. One of the most interesting new products on display here was something called Star Office from Star Division, a German company. 
Star Office is the first complete office suite, including word processor, spreadsheet, presentation package, and charting program that is HTML compatible, meaning you can instantly create a hot link between your document and a website. Star Office contains a complete WYSIWYG HTML editor that lets you move between the suite's edit window and a browser window so that you can easily upload pages created in Star Office via HTTP or FTP. If you're still trying to integrate telephony into your business, check out Phone Rider from a Swiss company called Mediaphonics. Phone Rider brings true telephone computer integration to small companies who don't have powerful PABX systems. Phone Rider is a plug and play okay, ISA board that lets your PC treat your telephone as a computer peripheral under Windows 95. That means full integration of voice and data in your PC, enabling even a small company to have sophisticated telephony features such as unified digital voicemail, customized phone services to different desktops, direct dialing from within PC applications, and speech to text conversion. Uh, could you please record it? Okay, you record. The name of the guy is Bill Gates, and the number is 215002. The telephone is your most reliable device on your office, and uh, your, the PC is the most efficient. What we would like to do is to merge the both. I mean, uh, we are using the telephone since uh, probably more than one century, and uh, this is nobody can uh, can uh, work without the telephone. And together with the PC, you have a terrific office, very efficient, cost-effective, and that's the reason because it's our target. A French company called Amplitude also found a way to make your PC a more powerful tool on the internet. This is Fax Mailer, a simple PC-based software package for broadcasting faxes over the internet. Fax Mailer lets you send up to 20,000 copies of a fax directly from your Windows 95 application. You can even customize the faxes so the different versions can go to different mailing list subsets. An Israeli company called Tegrity Incorporated has come out with an innovative new product called the Digital Flip Chart that uses video capture software to turn a projected computer screen into an interactive control device. Video cameras sense the change in the reflections from the screen and then interpret those visual changes as computer commands. That means a person making a presentation or presiding over a meeting can interact with the computer simply by touching the screen. The digital flip chart can use computer-generated images or you can use pieces of paper projected through the system's visualizer camera. The software also lets you record and document the meeting as a series of computer pages and images so that others can later see exactly what occurred during the meeting. And a French company called Source Development is reinventing the traditional desktop to bring it into the computer age. This is the Modula Executive Desk Blotter that includes a keyboard, a flat screen computer display, stereo speakers, a microphone, and a touchpad mouse. The Modula Electronic Desk Pad means a zero footprint computer on your desk and a natural integration of keyboard, computer display, and paper. The Modula Desktop connects to your PC using a single multifunction cable. Many parts of Germany were virtually destroyed during the war. In fact, that partially bombed out church and that memorial are symbols of the destruction of war. The same, of course, happened in many cities in Japan. Both Germany and Japan came back from that destruction to become global economic powers, but not in the PC business. And one of the interesting topics at this ETRA conference was the effort by several large Japanese companies, once again, to sell desktop PCs in the United States. I think what's happened is that you've had some of the biggest commercial corporations in the world finally recognize that the PC and technology and the network is changing the way business happens. And if they don't, if they don't get a position in this new world, they risk losing other businesses in which they also have very profitable presences. So you now have five huge Japanese electronics companies, Hitachi, Fujitsu, NEC, Sony, and Toshiba, all attempting to either enter the PC business for the first time or radically improve their role in the PC business. But will the big Japanese companies do any better this time around? Most experts are betting against it.
Uh, we have seen a number of companies who have asserted that they can come in and sell these under the brand name and through the same process as video gear and audio gear, for example, using an, a, a well-known brand name such as Sony, but there are others, and selling through Circuit City. And you, you can try to build a business model along those lines. I think what we've seen in contrast is that most consumers, in fact, appreciate the opportunity to look at a wide array of products. They're fairly knowledgeable consumers. And if you look from the channel point of view, it is the computer superstore that is the dominant place where many consumers are going. They go in part because of the wide array of choice. Someone might buy their first machine in an audio video store, but as soon as you become a, a knowledgeable user of computers, you want to look at the broadest array possible. I can basically predict the failure of all the Japanese companies in the computer industry for the next five years if they continue the same business model. It's not by plugging a lot of million dollars, it's not by plugging a lot of Japanese employees will start working overseas that they will change the significant issues at stake. The issue at stake is that they don't act local. The, the, the real issue is that they don't understand the local habits, the local marketing imperatives. Acer is one foreign PC company that has succeeded in the same space where the Japanese have failed. And the reason may be a simple one, according to Acer's founder and CEO, Stan Shi. The, the reason we approach local shareholder majority is because we believe IT application almost everywhere. The only local units can serve the huge requirement. So because of that, the local, they have an interest to commit to serve the customer requirement. And uh, we believe if we have this kind of approach, the company will sustain long enough. So I'm willing to lose control, but succeed or make money. If you didn't quite get that, Stan Shi says, I'm willing to lose control so long as I make money. Indeed, the surrender of control might have been the main theme here at this year's Etra, as everyone is realizing that the PC and the Internet businesses are moving so quickly and so unpredictably that no one has a handle on just what the future will look like. Well, I do think that even though we're seeing a lot of energy, a lot of new ideas, we're still at a very confused time. I think. Everyone recognizes that the Internet is a fundamental change. They've seen Microsoft's total turnaround. But nobody really knows what's going to be the real important center of this business yet. They think it might be Java. They think Microsoft might regain its control. But it's not clear. So that makes it a really interesting time here. But it's a little unsettling. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Schaffe at the Etra Conference in Berlin. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. Additional funding from PC Connection and Mac Connection, the catalog and online superstore with over 10,000 PC and Mac products, award-winning service, toll-free technical support, and overnight delivery. www.pcconnection.com.